Wow, you guys are awesome. <laughs> that was amazing. Were you tapping your foot? If you're not, somebody take your pulse, okay? <laughs> that was great. Golly, this is going to be fun now. Uh, I'm so glad you're here today. It is a great day. As you can already tell, it's exciting to be here together in worship. Um, we are going to be concluding the Andy Stanley series of Being Rich and What Matters Most. And, um, and I think it's ironic that this week they drew the name of the winner of the one point whatever billion dollars over in, right over in South Carolina. Isn't that crazy? I wonder if they're going to be good at being rich. Some of you go, I would love to have that opportunity <laughs> to be rich like that and be good at that. Um, we have learned a lot during this series. We've learned, we've learned some good news and we've learned some bad news. Uh, we learned that we are rich, and because of that, um, our wealth sometimes brings difficulties, like it's hard for us to completely depend on God because we have our wealth to fall back on. We learned that we are easily distracted uh, by our wealth, and because of all the opportunities that we have, uh, that it's afforded us to do, um, so much so that sometimes we get our priorities mixed up. And, um, and I'm hearing that from some of you, too, just like this has been a wake-up call. Maybe I need to revisit my priorities in my life a little bit. Uh, no one has said this to me here, but, but some folks in church don't want to hear money talked about at all uh, during the sermon. They say, I want to hear the gospel preached. And I want to tell you something. I don't think you can hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, without talking about money. It is so pivotal. It's, it's in the Bible so much, and Jesus addresses it um, so often. It is hard to hear and live into the good news of Christ without learning proper perspective on money and how it is. Um, we learn that it is a very attractive false god. It is very hard to resist. And we learn that it is our responsibility to use it to honor God um, and not be consumed by it. Um, we also learned about the deceitfulness of riches. We learned that um, it promises things it cannot deliver, um, that only God can give us things like security eternally and joy and peace in our hearts. And we learned that Christ is the only one that can do that. Last week we talked about uh, giving more because we have more, strategic giving, and we talked specifically about tithing as our goal and the, the kind that, that faithfully, faithfully follows uh, prayerful and thoughtful consideration of your gift. And I asked you to do that last week as we prepared for this Sunday, to prayerfully and thoughtfully have those conversations about how you would be committed to God. And I ask you to take that commitment card home uh, with you and consider that in your conversations. We will do more because we have more, and God blesses us even more. You remember Malachi 3.10, he says, Test me on this, and I will show you, I'll not, will I not open the floodgates of heaven and give you more than enough? Today I want to wrap all this up uh, with one key thought, and this is it. What you, do with what, you, uh, what you do with your time and your money reveals what you value in your heart. It reveals what you value in the heart. Jesus said it this way. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we are familiar with that verse. So let me ask you a question as we begin this morning. What does the way you spend your money and how you invest your time say that you really value? I had someone once say, I could probably look in your checkbook or look at your banking account and tell you what is most important to you by the way you spend your money. So what does the way you spend your money and how you use your time say about what you truly value in life? These are the things that tell us where our heart is and the things we treasure. Many of them are really, really great things, and they can be, they can be things like banana pudding is to me. I love banana pudding. I could eat it every day. Three times a day. But, you know, you can overdo it. And I rationalize it because bananas are good for you, right? They give you potassium. It's a fruit. It's all that stuff. But we all know that it is not healthy or wise to have banana pudding three meals a day every day of your life. It is, it is actually more enjoyable when we do it in moderation. It makes me appreciate it all the more. And God wants us to enjoy the wealth He has given us, to be wise and strategically uh, moderate, to give Him glory with how we use the wealth He's blessed us with. If we aren't careful, though, we can be rich in the wrong way. 
Um, Consider this story that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 12. Um, He says, in verse 16, he says, And he told them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man. Uh, Who is rich? We all are rich, right? So this story can be about us. It could be about us very well. Um, He's talking to people like us. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Whose crops did he say? My crops. Pay attention to that. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. We're going to finish this. But anybody see the problem here? You see it? Yeah, he made a significant rich man mistake. He thought that the more blessings were all for him. He thought that everything God gave him was actually for him to consume. And how do we know this? Well, we look at verse 20. It says to him, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. And then verse 21 really hits with power. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Now I want to look at this a minute. God was not angry with the man because he was rich. You need to understand this. Who gave him all his wealth? God did. God supplies us with everything he did. What God did was call him a fool, not because he was rich, but because he was rich in the wrong way. God called him a fool because he was rich toward himself, hoarding the wealth of God for himself. He wasn't being rich in what matters most. He wasn't rich toward God. And that's where God calls him a fool. The good news uh, for us is that we may have time to be rich in the right way. There's a course correction we can make because we're hearing this and we're going, oh no, or oh my, or oh thank you Lord that you've given me some direction. You know, um, if there is anything that has really stuck with me during this series is, is not that I need to be convinced of some things to do, but rather to live into the realization of what God has already given me. Um, that's really the spirit of the series. It's not what we are going to be, but rather what we already are through Christ and, and what he has already done and blessed us with. Look with me at, at 1 Timothy 6, our theme passage for this series. Let's look at it one more time. 1 Timothy six seventeen starts this way. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them, he says, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Why? Why, why, why? So that... They may take hold of the life that is truly life. That is the whole purpose behind this. I read this and I wonder, are we living a life that is not truly life? I mean, am I missing something? Is it possible that the Apostle Paul would know that in a moment like this, in a room like this, that there might be those of us who have said yes to Christ, who have professed Him as our Lord and Savior, and we want to follow Him, and yet we are living lives that are counterfeit. Because we haven't allowed God to have all of us. And the answer is yes, it is possible. I believe it is the heart of God in this text that we realize who we are and what God has given so we could become and live the lives that he has purposed for us. He intentionally wants us to live in to his promise. Folks, there is more in you 
than what you are currently experiencing. God is so much bigger. When you gave your life to Jesus, Scripture tells us that you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. That the Spirit of God in you is living. It is not a certificate we hang on the wall, um, but the Holy Spirit comes and it becomes your motor for living, your purpose, your drive, your heartbeat. And as we grow and mature in our faith, God teaches us to hear and respond to Him. This is learning to live a life that is truly life. And we constantly are learning to be His disciples, to be fully devoted followers of Christ. Brennan Manning is a, is a noted Christian author and speaker, and he wrote these words years ago. He wrote, the, single, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world aren't science teachers in public schools. They are not liberal politicians. He says, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today are Christians who come into a room like this, who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny Him by their lifestyles. He says, that is what an unbelieving world simply find unbelievable. We have a word for that. It's Paul called hypocrisy. Or practical atheism. Whatever you want to call it. It is when your life does not mirror what you say you believe. God has called us to live out a response to the grace He has given us. Are we saved by good works? No. Are we saved for good works? Absolutely. The ones that God has prepared for us in advance, as Ephesians tells us. So what do we do? 1 Peter 2.12 says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and give glory to God on the day He visits us. So your deeds are so evident, people praise God for you, even though they don't like you. It, does, it doesn't bring focus on us. It points to God. You know, I can trace my calling to ministry uh, back to my college days at Georgia Southern. I had tried out for a traveling music ministry, and I sat in my dorm awaiting to hear if I'd made the group. And little did I know that the four guys that would visit me later that night uh, would invest in me, they would challenge me, they would encourage me to live my life for God using the abilities that God had given me for good deeds that God had planned for me. They required discipline and discipleship both from me and for me. They challenged me to step out of my comfort zone and to not only sing solos in front of people that I did not know, but also to speak, which is even more terrifying. And I am forever grateful that they believed in me and they believed that God would want to use me. And soon I began to believe them, that God did want to use me. And He's given me a calling. And you know what? I believe in you. And I know that God will use you. He certainly wants to. The question is, will you trust Him? Will you trust Him to use you for His kingdom come? For His will be done? Proverbs 11.25 says this, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. There is a turnabout that comes in this. What does it mean? It means when you give to someone else to meet their needs, it will come back to you as refreshment. It is a satisfaction and a joy that wells up inside of you that can be found nowhere else. We are going to be generous in our good deeds. We are going to be rich in relationships and loving one another. John 13, 34 and 35 says this, says a new command I give you. He says, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. 
How will the world know we belong to Jesus? It says right there, by this, your love for one another, a giving of yourself to one another. God wants us to be rich in Him, and it starts with deep, loving, intimate relationships. It starts with irrational giving. It starts when we lay down our lives and use our gifts to bless and minister to those around us. Why? Because God has blessed us with more than we need. Because we are not, uh, we will not trust in riches, but we will trust in God who richly provides. Our faith is in God. We are in this together. And God glorified in us and through us. And he says, come on, you're part of the family. We're called the church. And this is the place where we love each other and we're there for one another. So let's take a moment to declare our love and gratitude to God as we bring our commitment cards to Him. As we look to the future and say, God, I, have, I want to do this with you in participation with all my brothers and sisters so that by this they will know our love for you and for one another. And may this movement be our act of worship, and may God be blessed by our giving. So as we prepare uh, at this moment, I want to invite you to get your cards out. Um, I'm going to have a prayer in just a moment, and I'm going to invite you to come and place them in this basket right down here in the front. 